Live. We are live and the chat is on. Okay. That looked great. That looked great tonight. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Looks like I didn't even try to make that happen. <laughs> All right, you guys. I'm really looking forward to this show tonight. And actually, tonight is our interview night. And guess what? We're not going to have an interview because we had a technical failure. And so we're going to do what we call a uh, open line. So instead of open line Friday, it's going to be open line Thursday. We haven't done this in a long time. We just don't do this anymore. <clears throat> okay. No, no. Just Wave him off. It, we either we're doing open line or or not, okay. and okay. I I made the decision at this point. Okay. Right, so we are going to do open line. Um, you may you may remember I uh, I told you that we were going to be interviewing our mushroom hookup guy, and this is a guy that we uh, uh, sat in on a class. Oh, ten years ago at the small farms conference and then we he did a a smaller class here over in Mayo and my son Joe and I went to that and we immediately started doing mushrooms and we've been doing mushrooms ever since and it's a field and forest and he's one of our affiliates and uh, they had a mix up a conflict of uh, dates right so we weren't able to interview him this week and that was kind of bad because I had told you that we would. And then our very own Brian Jacob was going to fill in. We we're going to interview him. That would have been a very interesting. We'll we'll do this again. But his uh, it wasn't working on his end, I guess, and we couldn't get the sound. So I just said, okay, plan B, plan B, we're going to open line. And open line is where you guys have the floor. You know, we have the, the chat here and – I will elaborate on uh, the questions that you have, or I will comment on the things that you have, and so on. And so it's gonna it's gonna require that you guys participate, right? And uh, there's a lot of things going on in our country right now. There's a lot of uh, good things, a lot of bad things, uh, and we can talk about it. I mean, I don't. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I, I think I do bring a perspective to things. All right, so our show tonight is going to be brought to you by Spears Automotive. Spears Automotive in Cadillac, Michigan. Friends of ours doing a great job, and they have a little story to relate. And this is why I wanted to uh, have them be the sponsor of tonight's show. I have a little bit of say in that. Um. My oldest son drove down to Chicago to pick up a car, right? And he was on his way back, would have been last night, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they stopped at a rest stop. And uh, the, I think it was the tie rod end just fell off. And so he didn't have any tools with him. Um, I think it was uh, the nut that holds the tie rod end on just backed off and just dropped. So they were quite a ways away. Uh, they weren't quite in Michigan yet. They had gone down to Illinois to get this car. And uh, it was 2 in the morning, and Kyle called up to Spears. They have a towing service as well. The man answered. Uh, it's a guy that works for John. And uh, he said, yeah, I can, I can come, but, you know, it's going to be kind of pricey. Uh, it's going to be in the neighborhood of 800 bucks, which, you know, that's a long way to, to drive a tow truck down and tow somebody back. And so Kyle said, well, let me check around. And turns out there was another outfit that was really close. They came and picked him up, got the car in, got it fixed. And they wound up getting back yesterday afternoon, about four o'clock in the afternoon. Anyway, Kyle's wife, Colleen, came over here to pick their kids up. And she said to me, you know, of all the rotten stuff that happened to him when they went on this trip, she said, do you know 
they called us back. Spears called us back to make sure everything was okay. Yeah. And it's, it's things like that that separate, you know, people you want to do business with from people you don't want to do business with, you know? And I just thought that was a, a pretty nice story. It's actually a very good business strategy because, you know, my daughter-in-law is a woman and if she feels as though someone's looking out for her, that makes them feel comfortable and she's more likely to bring business to John. And so that's good because I want, I want uh, Spears to do well because we need people in the tribe that can actually fix cars, right? <laughs> actually fix them. It's hard to find these days. Spears is doing good. Hey, can you shut this door, please? Uh, do you Thank you. Right yeah, I'll take a question. All right, I got a question here, and this is from Mike, Michael. Mike Hammond. He was at the, uh, one of the classes this fall. Mike Hammond. All right. All right, this is cool. This is a good place to start. Um, Crunchy's with us. Dion's with us. Oh, good. All right. These are good ones. Elvis with us, Craig, Eastern Oklahoma. Am I coming through there, Craig? Got a spare room in your house? No, we're actually going to stay in Tulsa. We got to go out to uh, my son's graduation. And from here, if we go 14 hours, make it to Tulsa, and then it's only nine hours from there to Lackland. So that's what we're going to do. And my my vehicle at this right now is over at Spears getting serviced because I want to make sure it's uh, going to make it over there and back. And I bought it from them too. And it's been a really good vehicle. It's a Honda Pilot. Highly, rec highly recommend that vehicle. My wife loves it. Crunchy. Experimenting with Koji fermentation on beef tonight. It's like a 20-day dry age overnight. Huh. And then Brian Jacobs is here saying, <laughs> sorry, man, I was thinking about you last night because it was snowing to beat the band here last night, Brian. It was snowing. And my family, <clears throat> they went to, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for a subject tonight, it's not going to happen. This is an open line, so we're going to be all over the place. So if you tuned in to hear something, not going to hear it. We're all over the place tonight. Anyway, Brian, last night I was here by myself, and so I was just puttering around, and then I find out, well, they're not going to be back till 9.30. So I went out. I had a few things to do, and the truck was sitting there, and it was looking good, you know, the snow coming down across it. And I went over, and I sat in it, and I thought, you know, I don't want to just waste gas, but I cranked it. She fired right up, fired right up, and the snow's coming down. It's coming sideways. So I let it warm up a little bit, and then I started cruising. I came back and put gas in it, and then I cruised around with it, just listening to tunes. It was nice. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I bought a Ford one-ton off of Brian. Uh, it's a 1973 one-ton pickup. You know, it's the dual wheels in the back. It's got a long bed. And um, <clears throat> it's got toolboxes on the side now. Nice ones. A little bit rusty, but real nice. And it's going to be my my service vehicle for the farm. So I I, I got, I got kind of kicked out of the, the maintenance shop because now it's a better building and we're using it for butchering. And we really don't make money off maintenance around here, but without having our own maintenance outfit, who do you find to come to the farm and fix, you know, a 1962 haybine? You have to be able to do it yourself. And it requires that you can cut, weld, fit, and all that stuff. And so this truck is going to be outfitted with everything I need and lights, and it will be my daily driver. All right. So yes, the man van is going down the road. It is going down the road. So anyway, but let me get to this first question. But I was thinking of you last night as I was cruising around and I'm thinking, 
okay, uh, I'm I'm cruising around uh, by myself. You know, nobody was here, and I put the tunes on. What did I listen to? Credence. I, I have this kind of thing that I listen to, and I'm listening to CCR. I'm listening to Boz Skaggs, Jackson Brown. Let's see who else. Little Pink Floyd in there. Um, I mean, I was cruising for a while. I went all the way down into town, turned around and came back, got me some a snack to eat, you know, and something to drink. And uh, and I'm thinking, when I was 18 years old, driving around in a truck that was a year newer than this one, the one that my friend's father's construction company had was a 70 four like like my other one my other one's a 74 and we'd be cruising around in that listening to tunes having a few cool uh pops you know and uh thinking that was a new truck then and i'm sitting in that truck last night and saying i'm thinking to myself this thing was built in 1973 it's 50 years old back then in say 1976 i got my license in 76 we didn't have 50 year old cars cars hanging around cars or trucks we didn't the cars and trucks that we had were like five years old and they get sixty thousand miles on them and it was getting close you know um people did not put the miles on vehicles back then at least where i lived we didn't do it so any and I'm thinking, here I am driving around. This thing is 50 years old. If we do all the things we're going to do to it to zero time it, my kids can be driving around in it in another 50 years. It'll be 100 years old. And why wouldn't why wouldn't it make it? You know, it it will. Okay. Okay. This is from Michael, and he took one of our classes. Uh, and he says, I've been pretty busy. I keep missing the zoom thing. Wanted to ask, how do I feed my chickens for free or at least without having to buy feed? So that would be free. I don't have a butcher operation. I figure that's some of how you guys don't have to buy feed for them. What's another way? Grow some stuff for them. I've heard of other things like getting scrap food from restaurants, making a huge mulch compost pile, and they can eat off that indefinitely. I could do that, but just wanted to know what Mark was getting at when he said, if you're buying feed for your chickens, would love to not buy it. Yeah. Yeah. See, um, this is, uh, yeah. Free bird for sure. Yeah. Skinner. Yep. Um, Chickens, all right, let's get the down and dirty on chickens. And and I, uh, I'm not the guy that came up with this. This is, uh, I heard Salatin, Joel Salatin, um, speak about this at some big affair years ago, years ago. And uh, I've never forgot it. And uh, chickens were something, you think back to, uh, say like the Waltons, right? That that show that used to be on. And, and just outside of her kitchen was the chicken house. It was right outside the kitchen. And when they finished up with everything with a meal and they had anything left over that they were not going to save for the next meal, they would just throw it out to the chickens. And that's how they fed the chickens. The, the chickens were the cleanup crew. But you fast forward... And when people who don't know anything about homestead living get chickens, it's sort of like when they get a puppy, they figure, I got to get puppy feed. No, the dog will eat from the table. You know, he'll eat what you eat. Um, but people think, well, I got a puppy. I got to get puppy feed. And if you go and ask the man at Tractor Supply, I just got a puppy. What should I do? He's not going to say, oh, no, feed it from your table scraps. He'll say, oh, well, you want this track to supply puppy feed right here. This is what you want. So uh, 
your chickens, you should be uh, looking for alternate forms of feed for them. And I've known this for a long, long time. Uh, so you're right. We do. We operate a butcher shop on the farm. We happen to raise mangalitsa pigs and we raise uh, grass fed beef. So when we butcher, a lot of times you have bones that still have a little bit of meat on them. You can throw it in with them and they'll just clean it off. So they're the cleanup crew. And chickens are omnivores. So they can eat meat and they can eat vegetables. Okay, so don't worry about that. I know I made a video a short time ago, and it's really funny to see the things that people say. People will say, don't feed your chickens meat. It will turn them into carnivores, and they'll start eating your children. You know, people say the stupidest things. Like, I don't know where they come up with these things. One guy said, uh, oh, a guy said, if you feed your chickens beef fat, then the eggs will have high cholesterol. And you don't want that. Like, okay, you're trying to be the smartest guy in the room, but that's really stupid, you know, to say that. Uh, there's no stupid questions. Stupid comments, though. That's a stupid comment. So um, I think what you want to do is start to... Uh, work on your certification and it's a certification that we we do certify people here from baker's green acres and it's uh it's a ddi right it's a ddi certification that stands for dumpster diggers international right and once you get that certification you will be qualified to get in just about any dumpster that there is and be able to bring forth the riches of the dumpster. And when somebody catches you in there, you're going to feel good about yourself. You're going to feel real good about yourself, which reminds me of a story. I see Jeremy Huggins is with us tonight, so you'll like this. I, <clears throat> I worked with a guy one time when I was in the Air Force, and me and him locked it up a couple of times. And I wound up coming out on top and he was wrong and, and, and the boss had to straighten him out on, on how things really work. And so there was some hard feelings there, but then time went by, we both made rank and everything was okay. You know, it was one of those things. And on Maelstrom Air Force Base, there was what they called the junk pile or the scrap wood pile. And all the organizations on base that had scrap wood would bring it down there and they would dump it. And anybody was allowed to go in there. And if there was something you needed, you could take. And so every single day that I went into work, I was always, you're going to want to know this, Chief. I was always early. And uh, so I would go down to the scrap pile. And one day I'm down at the scrap pile and I was had a friend of mine with me. And we saw something inside of a dumpster. And so here we are, you know, we got our uniforms on and everything, but it's pretty desolate. And we got in the dumpster and we were looking around in there. And this other guy pulls up, this guy that I had had some hard feelings with. His name was Al. And he pulls up and he's looking through the scrap pile. He's looking just through the wood. And uh, <clears throat> I called him out by last name and I kind of startled him. And here I was looking out from a dumpster. I'm in the dumpster looking out. And I said, I said, do you have no respect for yourself? <laughs> I just thought that was so funny. Anyway, you would have had to be been there. You know, I think, Hug, you probably can kind of dig that. You know, you're not supposed to be acting that way, getting in dumpsters, whatever, but I did. So anyway, uh, that's what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to learn how to uh, find things that maybe you can't eat, but that your chickens can. And I am not saying never buy a bag of chicken feed because chicken feed can be some pretty good stuff, but they should get only a little bit of that in a day because you want to make sure that they're getting the minerals that they should have, you know, and you pretty, you know, it's pretty uh, safe to assume that they're going to, but if you're getting nice hard shell eggs and they look good and all that stuff, hey, it's good enough. Don't worry about 
you know, well, we have to give them a 16% feed. No, you don't. No, you don't. And then think about uh, your space that you're in, right? And think about how many grasshoppers you have per square yard. How many, you know, Japanese beetles, how many you know, ants and all things like that. How many of those do you have? And then if you could, if you could gather them all up and then you could put them in with your chickens, they'd, they'd take care of them and it's good protein and they're, they're going to be fine with it. Earthworms, um, is something else I'll get into in a minute, but you, you, if you were to be able to gather all that stuff up and put it in their pen, that'd be great for them, but you can't really do that because you'd be going around with your magnifying glass and your tweezers. Oh, I got one. I got another one. You know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't really work out because you'd be working too hard for, you know, the protein that you're finding out there in, in your yard or your space. So then you have to think about, how could I let the chickens go out and do the harvest themselves? It's kind of a problem there. If they're out in the morning, they're going to find your strawberry patch or your raspberry bushes or your tomato, uh, your, your, your cherry tomato plant. They'll find it and they'll just take a bite out of each tomato. So that won't work. And other things they'll find too. So there's kind of a trick it might take a little fence building so you can vector them away from uh, buildings because as soon as the sun starts to go down, they want to get back to their house. They want to get back to their beds. So if you can swing a big gate that faces them, say, towards the woods and you open it up in the summertime, say, 630, they'll blitz out to the woods and they'll just go wild finding things. But then when the sun starts to dip down, well, oh, we got to get home and they'll all go back in. You may have to help them a little bit, uh, like not the crowd of them, but there'll be a couple of, um, dumb ones, or maybe they're the, maybe they're going to try and escape. They're getting organized. Um, but see, that is a good way to, uh, utilize what is on your property. All the clover that's out there, you know, the grasses, bugs, worms, all that stuff. There's another way too. <clears throat> and we do this, and this is really kind of, kind of fun in a way you want to, you want to always be looking at liabilities and say, how could I turn that into an asset? Right? So I get in bed at night and I'm trying to read and I start getting dive bombed by moths. And I mean, like, I wish I had a chicken here because I would feed you to that chicken right now. And I wind up killing the thing and then it's just, it goes to waste. So how can I get the moths down to the chickens? I'm going to, excuse me. So I'll, I'll let you think about that one. <clears throat> I'll let you think about how to get the moths down to your chickens. But what about, maggots what about maggots it's good protein protein's protein um how can you generate maggots you know and i can let you think about that one but i'll tell you what we do you take a bucket and you just go wild on it with a half inch drill and you drill holes in that thing you drill lots of holes and my bucket i have well i did if you come here you'll see well where is your your maggot generator uh, I've taken it down because I'm doing a reconfiguration on my chicken area. But um, you want a post that's out off the ground and you want to be able to, you know, like a clothesline, you want to be able to send it out. Because what you're going to do is you're going to put things in there that the flies will land on and they will lay eggs. The eggs will become maggots and the maggots will fall out of the bucket. And the chickens will be like, it, it's like a, it's pennies from heaven, you know. It's like, whoa, whoa here's a maggot over here, <laughs> and uh, and you're you're creating, you're creating it, you know. You're, you, 
that's a good way to do it. That's a really good way to do it. So, uh, yeah, I think that if you're buying feed for your chickens all the time, your eggs are going to be pretty expensive and you really don't want that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I saw a guy on the internet one time and he made a compost pile in his, in his chicken area. Right. And that looked pretty good to me. Uh, I make a lot of compost piles and I think it's a, a great thing to do. Um, in my new configuration on my chicken area, <clears throat> oh, might as well show you. Yeah, if I had something to draw with. Yeah, this area is being reworked and all the pens are gone. Oh, well. I might be able to do something for you here. Okay, so I got this. This won't be as good as my normal way of doing it, but it'll work. So I just built a new chicken house. And I put in uh, some really big pens I never did this before because I never realized that you know you can utilize all that space because I didn't know how to utilize the space okay so I'm just going to go one two and three and let's say this one is 50 feet by 50 feet they're all about the same. They're all about the same size. All right. So you get the picture. There's the house. There's the house right there. And my chickens are all right now in here. All right. But I will, before too long, it's got to be warmer. I'll have gates so they can access you know, so I can vector them out of the house. So here, if I want them to be in pen number three, I will just open a door here. And then to get them over into pen two, I'm probably going to make something like a, a tunnel. And I'll make it out of, say, uh, woven wire and conduit. And when I want them to go to that other air, that other pen, they'll just be traversing through pen one right into pens two, let's say. All right. And all of these pens I can get in with the tractor. All right. And they're pretty good, pretty good size. So, um, I have a rototiller and I think a lot of you will have a problem with that. A rototiller, you know, yeah, I have a rototiller. I do. And I really like my rototiller. I paid good money for that rototiller, and I'm keeping it. Um, but in a situation like that, if I get in there and they are manuring in that area real hard, and I get in there with a tiller, and I till it all up, and then I plant over it. And in the summertime, you want to plant like rye, um, clover. Clover would be outstanding actually clover would just be outstanding because it, it will soak up so much of that nutrient and then the chickens have fresh pasture to go out out on so you're actually growing feed for them right um you could do you could do pumpkins in there chickens do pretty good on pumpkins and that's something to think about you can always scrounge pumpkins and feed them to your chickens I, my chickens have ate a lot of pumpkins, a lot of pumpkins. Plus, I give them uh, waste bread, which I have a bread disposal contract, and I get a lot of bread. Um, yeah, so if you set up a situation where you can do rotational grazing, I think you're going to be in, in good shape. And I'm going to go one better than that. Um, this... 
this end is south, all right? So the house is here, and this is going to the south, all right? Well, I'm going to put in a gate somewhere around here, right? Somewhere around here. It's going to have to be built. And I don't know if I want to put it on a timer or I want to keep it low tech. I think keeping it low tech, there's a lot to be said for that. And then I want to be able to go out there and open it up and say, open it up at, I'll, 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 it depends. I'll open it up, let's say 6.30, 7 o'clock in the summertime. And then they'll have all of this field area to go in. Now, this field area connects up to over here. This is our pasture where we have all of our chicken tractors going. So I don't want the laying chickens to mix in with them because then they'll, oh, feed over here and look at all these pretty girls. I'll stay over here. You don't want that. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of strategic fencing so that they don't find that area and keep them out of it. So it takes a little doing. Um, there are people that really advocate for those fen uh, those um, those that portable fencing, you know, the Premier One type fencing that you electrify for poultry. I don't like it because I don't like the way it looks and it is a pain in the rear end. So I would rather build hard fences with chicken wire. Um, I, I'm just going to utilize the field fences that I have and put two, uh, put chicken wire up against them and stretch it tight. So it actually will look good and it'll be functional. And I'd rather spend the time doing that and it's permanent than having to move those ugly, uh, you know, temporary fences around. I think they look terrible. And they're also dangerous too, because I've had, we've lost like a couple of goats and a pig that would get tangled up in them. I've tried it twice and both times wound up the heck with this and just ditched them. You know, I, I, I took the poles off of them, but I ditched the netting. All right. So that's what I think about that. Um, and I'm sure if you think along those lines, you'll come up with stuff too. All right. So let's get back here. Dion had a good question. Okay. If I was starting over, how much land would I look for and why? Um, at this stage of the game, uh, knowing what I know now, our first farm that we had in Montana, it was uh, 13 acres. And I, I just had this mindset like, oh, it's just a little 13 acre place. Like it's not real, but I could have done so much more with it. And I just had this mindset that it's not big enough. It's not big enough. Um, when we got this place, what I gained was grass, grassland. And grassland is absolutely the way to go. You do not want to get into uh, raising grain crops for feed. You don't want to do that. You want to, well, I don't want to tell you what to do, but this is what I'm going to do is uh, any place where I have open ground, I am going to grow, gr grow grass unless it's opened for some other reason. Like I'm going to grow a garden there, or I'm going to grow turnips there for my pigs or, you know, um, radishes or field peas or something like that. But any place else is going to be covered with multi-species of grass. And the reason for that is grass grows good all the time you know it just needs a little bit of rain and if it gets really dry and and we have to we can pump water through a sprinkler we can we can irrigate grass it's not hard to do it it uh and when you have that grass you got a couple options you can cut the grass and then you can dry it and bale it for hay uh, you could chop the grass and you could, you know, 
make haylage out of it. You could do that. I don't do that, and I don't know that much about it. My neighbors do it, and they seem to have a pretty good thing going. They feed it to cows. Um, I'm just getting my dry my dry hay uh, game down, you know, after all these years, it's year to year. It, things change. I had, I had uh, problems last year and I had to go to my neighbors and say, help, you know, I couldn't do it. Um, but I think the way to go is with grass. So my uh, species of preference is, is going to go like this. It's going to go cows, chickens and then pigs pigs are the ultimate cleanup crew so if you butcher a cow and gee what do i do with this hundred pound stomach that's full of grass no i'm not going to eat it um you pick it up with the front end loader and dump it in with the pigs and they devour it and they grow on it right otherwise what, what would you do with it you would just i don't know bury it someplace or compost it yeah you could do that but the, the pigs are the ultimate cleanup crew. But let's say that we couldn't couldn't get our junk bread contract. Let's say we didn't have that. I'm not buying feed. No way. It's way too expensive for what you get out of the animals. Um, we, we would grow some. We would definitely grow some crops for them and try to keep that going. But with the cattle... Grass grows everywhere and it's so resilient. There's so many different species. You know, we should be having major, major conversations about pasture. You know, pasture is a deep subject where it sort of gets overlooked like, oh, yeah, out in the cow pasture. No, that cow pasture is a, a diamond in the rough. You know, you can tweak it and you can really get some calories off everything really comes down to calories when we start talking like this uh off the uh off the field you're taking grass the grass is going to be calories for the cattle the cattle are going to be calories for for the family or you're going to sell them for dollars you know where, where you need dollars um via fat milk and uh lean beef. Um, the other thing that you're producing is manure. So I think I had my numbers wrong. I think I gave you a bad number one time, but cows will eat about 30 pounds of dry matter a day. So hay, they'll eat about 30 pounds, which if you had a, a large square bale and let's say it was a 90 pounder, they're going to eat a third of it, right? A full size cow. But then she will give you 50 pounds of manure. Does that sound right? Maybe I, maybe I don't have that right. Um, seems to me I read something someplace that, that went against that. <clears throat> but she's going to drink about 10 gallons of water. Maybe somebody can look at that. Average manure output per day, an adult cow. I don't know, maybe somebody could look at that while we're... <clears throat> so we can get that straight. But... My first place was 13 acres. It had a, a really nice creek going through it. it, had some beautiful trees down in this little valley. And we could have irrigated the field. We could have done a lot to increase the, uh, the fertility of the field, but we didn't know anything about that. We didn't know anything about that. Uh, I would have, if I had asked my neighbor, he'd say, oh, you got to get some fertilizer on there. But, you know, the fertilizer is not really what you want to do because it's not really sustainable. Um, but you can do a lot with a small piece of ground. Uh, you know, we started here with 78 acres and then we increased to 80 and then we fell back to 72 when I sold the house next door. And now we've increased to 150 because we attained another 80 next door. <clears throat> it means more work, but it's more grass. More grass equals I got to feed more cows, which means uh, these cows have to be butchered and the meat has to be sold. So 
I'd have to think about that, Dion. Like if, like the, having this piece of property has really stretched my, stretched me as a, as a person, as a man, because I've got this going on over here and this going on over here. And then this piece of thing breaks and somebody's got a problem over here and, oh, it's going to rain tonight. And those, the cows are out, the cows got out yesterday. Um, so, you know, you, you could see where if you had a small place, you could really have things under control. So that there's a lure there. But this place keeps me hopping. I mean, I'm jamming it. Um, there was something going on tonight and I wasn't able to attend. And I thought, well, you know, what if I got questioned about that? Well, how come you didn't come to this game? So like I'm working, you know, I've got a lot to do. So uh, that's a hard one to answer. Like I'm thinking that someday uh, I will be the guy here that just mows the lawn, you know, and the kids will have taken it over and they'll decide what direction it's going to go. And that's okay because I won't be doing it. I'll just be mowing the lawn, right? And they're going to have to like keep me out of the road probably, you know. Um, so I had a small place, 13 acres, uh, but I didn't have as much knowledge then as I do now. Uh, where I was at in Montana, it was all, everybody did things the same way, kind of, sort of like they do here. When I got here, <clears throat> we would still be doing things like everybody else, probably, if it were not for, pro probably for Joel Salatin, if it were not for him, because we got his book. Met him at the small farms conference. Uh, didn't meet him personally, but heard him speak, and that just that just opened up a whole nother facet of of farming that we hadn't considered. You know, you see these big farms with all the black and white cows, and well, that's how you do it. And the everything's geared towards that. I'm gonna sneeze again, and. Uh, we just wouldn't have thought of the, all of this on our own. You know, we wouldn't have. And even though we did get tuned into that type of farming, the, the sustainable type of farming or the uh, traditional farming, I would say, even though we got tuned into it, it was still like, yeah, but everybody expects us to do what everybody else is doing. So there's sort of pressure. If you're going to succeed and taken seriously, you got to do it like everybody else. And we did succumb to that for a long time. I had this mindset that we know we need to do one thing right, one thing. And now I'm completely against that, doing one thing right. I think you need to do a lot of things, just do them. And then incrementally, you'll get better at them, but you're getting better at a lot of things at the same time. You know, I, I don't advocate for, well, Learn this one thing, and when you totally have that mastered, you can go on to the next thing. I, I'm not, I'm not like that, uh, and I don't even think that's good. I think you need to. Okay, I want this. I want this fence built. I'm going to build it, and you stand back from it and say, "Well, I know I could do better next time," and you can do better next time because you'll you'll know what to do. Just a sec. <sighs> So I hope that helps. Hope that helps. Keep them coming, though, Dion. You got good questions. Craig is an hour south of Tulsa. You know who else is in Tulsa, I found out. Yesterday I was doing a, a look around because we were considering doing a lamb harvest class. And so I thought, well, what, you know, what do you, uh, is anybody else doing it? Where do you start? How do you price it? You know, is, does anybody care? Would anybody want to learn how to process uh, a lamb? And so I started looking and there's a guy named Brandon something or other, and he is in Tulsa and he goes by meat Smith, calls himself the meat Smith. And I actually met that dude one time. Yes, indeed. I did long, many, many moons ago. I met him. And I guess he's doing good. 
but he has a class and it's a three-day class doing lambs which i didn't completely read it but um he takes three days to do it so sounds good charges uh 1400 bucks yeah it is a great truck i went i went to spears today because my other truck is down there hope john's not listening <laughs> but i went down there and i said hey so uh what about my other truck here <laughs> i've been bugging him a little bit and uh so they put new exhaust manifolds on it because the old ones had one, one of them had blown out and then they put a new exhaust system on it. Duels coming back with cute little mufflers on it about like that. Well, the mufflers are about that long and then it comes off of the muffler and then goes back over the back axle and then turns down. Like you can't see them. They're under the bed. And I, I was looking at it, and I thought, wow, these guys are, um, these guys are artists. I mean, they it comes down out of the engine compartment and turns up a couple degrees, and then straightens out and goes back. So, you know, this truck is a four wheel drive truck, and sometimes I'm in some deep stuff with it, and I don't want to catch the mufflers on things. That's happened. Oh yeah, it's happened. And so I said, can you just, you know, get them up out of the way? You got to be careful. You can't get too high because then the pipes are right under the floor and they heat things up. So I think they did. I think they knew what they were doing. And just a quick look under there. And I said, ah, oh, that looks nice. So I'll, I'll show you guys that when that truck comes back, that's the one that we're going to bear down on we're going to put some new fenders on it new inner fenders outer fenders new doors because the the windows don't work too good on, on these doors and uh let's see a few other things then we'll paint it they're good trucks man good trucks it's one i use for plowing of course not today i didn't okay What's the best recommendation you can do for new generation small farmers? That's easy. That's really easy. Just do it. All right. You may not be in the place that you want. doesn't matter. You may not have the tools that you need, all the tools that you need. Use what you have. You know, let's say that you're in an apartment and you don't have anything except uh, maybe a, a little porch. Get you some white buckets because you're going to need white buckets on your farm anyway right? Get the white buckets, you know, five gallon buckets that you can get them all over the place. You know, which ones I mean with the handles on them and then start mixing up some, uh, some soils, get some books. Now, now's a good time. Do some research on soils, what kind of soils you want and, uh, research container gardening and out on your porch, you can have tomato plants and learn how to trellis those tomato plants. And all of that that you're doing, when the time comes for you to move to your own place, that goes with you. The books go with you. The knowledge that you have goes with you. So start now. As a matter of fact, start right now. Say, okay, I'm on it. And when you want to listen to videos about, um, I don't know things let's see what do i listen to that i shouldn't listen to i listen to uh i should be listening to credence clearwater revival but i probably shouldn't be listening to the liberal hive mind because it just irritates me or what else uh do i listen to i listen to david nino rodriguez i probably shouldn't be listening to that but you want to find out just how messed up things are and you know i'm not in it so I, but I should be listening to homesteading things, which I have, I have started doing that. I don't know if I told you guys this, but yeah, I did tell you this, but I'll tell you this, some new people here. Um, we make videos, how to videos and inspirational videos and stuff like that for 
for homesteading to kind of get people into it, right? It's part of what we what we do. And recently, some of these videos have just, phew, they've skyrocketed. And it's not all positive. There's a lot of negative comments in there, but some of them have like 125,000 views and it's a full length video. And then our subscribers has gone way up. We're close to 9,000 subscribers. And our goal is, you know, 10,000 and then things open up to you. So we're going to make that probably before the end of next week. And uh, when that happened, I started to study my own videos and figure out, well, why did this one do so well? But this one over here, which I prefer that I made, didn't do that well. Like 125,000 views and over here, 240 views. You know, that it's it just it doesn't add up in... I know when I see the 240 views, I see, I say, oh, well, hell with this, you know. But really, then I have to get a hold of myself and say, wait a minute, I'm not making it for views. It, it feels good, sort of. But what makes the difference here? What In reality, what makes the difference? What makes the difference is when I go to somebody somebody else's farm who the first time I went there, they didn't have anything but a tent that they were milking a cow in, literally a tent. And now they've got a building and they've gone through and stumped the whole place and it looks nice and working on getting it seeded. That I, I, I have, um, I have some ownership in that. I I take ownership in that because I I took ownership in hey tell me what I ought to do. Okay, I'll tell you I, this is what I think I'd do. And and so I don't I don't know as I actually told him to do that but um you know, I tell a lot of people that the one thing that's missing these days is our ability to uh to process animals. So if you want the upper hand, that's it. That is it. So that's the recommendation I have. Just do it and then start to put together a priorities list. Um, they have this saying, and it's, uh, if you want to live, you will listen to people who know, right? If you want to be a successful homesteader, listen to people who are actually homesteading. Actually. Because there are people that their their job is content creator. And, you know, they tried ceramics. They tried uh, cooking shows. They tried, you know, embroidery. And then... Hey, people really like this homesteading thing. I think I'll I'll make homesteading uh, content. But then when you really look at it critically, it's like, well, you know, you got two sheep, dude. That's not, you're not really trying at this. You're not expanding. You can talk about it all day long. There's this one dude that shows up on my feed all the time. And it's, once in a while, I have to listen to him because it's kind of startling what he says. But he's usually just walking through the woods, you and it's it's a homesteading channel, and he's more talking about prepping for, uh, you know, really bad times. Sometimes he's got a rifle across his chest, and uh, I'm kind of wondering, do you, maybe you live in town, maybe you're not even a homesteader. So listen to people that you can see that they're actually doing the thing that you that you think that you want to do or if you okay if a guy says hey i'm a homesteader and he's doing some productive things and he's got a good bottom line and he sounds believable but and he's actually really doing it that's the that's the person that you probably want to be listening to and don't listen to any women none don't listen to women at all <laughs> I said that with a straight face <laughs> No, there's actually, a, there's one uh, woman that I really like. 
Melissa Norris. I really like her. Uh, okay. Horatio Lay, good evening. I am in Maryland looking to start farming in Sierra Leone, West Africa. I've been watching your videos, never farmed before, looking for ideas and advice on farming in tropical weather. Well, I'm, I might not be your guy because I've never done that, but I, I did spend quite a bit of time down in South America. And um, there is a lot of people who have moved down there because land is really uh, accessible and they're farmers and they've, they've done pretty well down there. Uh, the tropics, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what I would grow if I lived in the tropics. I did live in the tropics for a while and I can't think of anything you know, used to just, you could pick bananas off trees in South America for sure. Um, where would I start? I tell you one place you could start. Uh, there's a term called terra preta, terra preta, and it's just spelled just the way it sounds. And that's going to put you on a, uh, a trail and you follow that trail and it'll lead to this and lead to this. But I found Terra Preta when I started making biochar and where biochar leads is to Terra Preta and Terra Preta leads to South America. And you will uh, find areas where there is Terra Preta that uh, the soil is five feet deep and all around it, it's only this deep and it's it's what they call bitter soils right nothing much grows in it uh plants grow better in the air than they do the soil in those places and how they got soils to be fertile in south america was a mystery for a long long time until archaeologists started looking at it you know at first it was like hey uh it's a it's a big circle here that's that's fertile, and right outside the circle, there's no fert fertility. And then hey, it appears as though a lot of people used to live here. Where did they go? And you know, you, you'll you'll put you'll put it together, and then you you can uh, you can see that agriculture is big in South America or in the tropics because your your growing season is going to be a lot different than it is in the north. But then you have to deal with snakes that'll kill you, bugs that'll kill you, you know, certain types of frogs that if you step on them, it'll kill you. I can't deal with that, you know, killer bees probably, you know, and then the natives. <laughs> the, na <laughs> the cannibals. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't go with you, man. I'd go down there. I, when I was down there, I met a guy and this guy was no joke. <clears throat> and we were talking about boa constrictors because there was one that had been killed and it was supposedly a massive boa constrictor. And he says, that's nothing. He says, I've seen with my own eyes boa constrictors in the river, in the Amazon, that were as big around as a 50-gallon barrel. Yeah. Nah, I don't want to do that. Unless I can be packed down really, really good. If I'm if I'm strapped down real good, then maybe. Oh, 623s. <laughs> yeah. Good airman. Good airman. He's saying because I am half an hour late or half an hour early for work, so I'm a good airman. Not the weirdest thing that has happened on a base. <laughs> no. I can tell you another story. This is a little bit dark, but it's true. This is a true story. When I got to Maelstrom, I had come from Loring Air Force Base in Maine. And there was a guy at Loring that I ran into at the Chow Hall a couple of times. We had the same last name, right? He worked for CE. And you run into him and you're like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and then I got to Loring, uh, to Maelstrom. And I ran into the same guy at, at Maelstrom. What are you doing here? No, I got orders to come here. I just got here a month ago. 
what's it like? I said, that's ah, pretty good. There's a lot of things to do. And evidently that guy shot himself down at the junk pile. And the word got around, of course, they sealed it off. You know, word got around a guy, last name Baker, shot himself down in the junk pile. And that word got back to my squadron. And I had someone come dashing into my office and look at me with the strangest look on his face. And then leave. (laughs) And then go down there. It was the first sergeant. I said, what's the problem? What was that all about? Uh, Do you know a guy, he says, do you know a guy from CE with the same name as you? I said, yeah. He says, well, we thought maybe that was you because the junk pile and the word and the name Baker. Nope, wasn't me. But that's a true story. That's a true story. Terrible. The dump used to be that way in the old days. You come back with more stuff than you went with. Oh, yeah. Me and my dad, we used to do that, too. Uh, Jill saying, sorry to everyone expecting an interview about small acreage and big results. We had technical difficulties, and we have rescheduled Brian for March 9th. Okay? March 9th. Say, so we'll, we'll get Brian back on. Brian's a pretty interesting guy. And he's got some some real neat things going on down his place. And he's got a good testimony, too, about things. So I think you guys will like it. The ghost. I was thinking of asking the owner of the old potato farm if I could rent a small piece of his land for several small growing projects. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah. I used to... When I lived in northern Maine at Loring Air Base, that's what they grow up there is potatoes everywhere. And they they don't call them potatoes. They call them potatoes. Potatoes. Of course, that's in Maine. You know, wicked good Maine. And uh, lots of times uh, we would walk through fields that the harvester had gone through and it'd be full of potatoes. There's just so many potatoes and they just leave them there to rot. Yeah, they would stink too. Okay, Crunchy Mama, sheep and goat classes are great. Perfect stand in for deer. Do the class before hunting season starts. Yeah, okay, we're going to put it out there, Sean, and see if if there's, you know, an interest on it. Yeah, and uh, I want to stay with our beef processing because I think that's essential. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work doing, you know, doing beef, but in a class um, setting. It's a lot of work. Oh, Joni's with us. Long time. Where you been? WCM68TN. Grow bags work even better than buckets. Yeah, I've seen that. I saw a bag that was configured with a, like a Velcro opening on the side and you fill it with soil and then you plant potatoes in them. And then you can open that thing up and you can steal potatoes out of there all season long. That looks good. That looks like a good thing to do. Oh, and there's so many other things that you can do in a small place, in a small area. If you have a a yard, okay, I might as well bring this up. <clears throat> because I'm I'm being pushed on this. Uh, the idea was floated at least a year ago, and uh, we're going to make it happen. But on the property next door, there's a garage, a garage, or what else could you call it? A car hole. There's a garage over there, and it has a small apartment in it. And uh, we've done quite a bit of work on it because we were using it for a maintenance area. My son Keith was using it, but now he's in the Air Force now, so he won't be using it for a while. But we're going to convert it into a quarters, and then we're going to fence off one quarter acre because uh, the majority of people in the United States live on a quarter acre or less. And then on that quarter acre, we're just going to 
exploit every square inch that we can with productive processes that are in line with homesteading. Like it's definitely going to have, um, you know, berry bushes and grapes and raised beds for vegetables. There'll also be a pen of pigs over there, two, three, four pigs. Um, there will be a, chi a chicken house outside the, the kitchen and anything else that we can think of that's productive along those lines. And then we're going to use it because it's right next to the campground. So we'll use it sort of like a, a display, but people can actually stay there like a bed and breakfast or a, an Airbnb. I don't know. We're going to feed them breakfast. Probably not. They can eat eggs out of the, the hen house. And I think that will be really interesting because we could even have a calf over there. You really could. Howard Air Force Base. Howard? That doesn't ring. Oh, yeah. Howard's down in Panama. No, I wasn't there. I was not there. Never been there. Nathaniel Hathorne. That's how I felt living in Wellfleet, Cape Cod, swimming out there with the giant whites. Yeah, isn't that where Jaws was filmed out, out in that neck of the woods? You know what? You can have that. I, I like the ocean, but those big animals like that, I don't. No, the ones that want to eat me. No, I don't. It, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be taken down to like 30 feet and ripped limb from limb. You know, I, I just wouldn't want to do that. Okay. T-A-C-F-E. T-A-C-F-E. What does that mean? Where are located? I'm direct southwest Indiana, mummy bear. Tack fee? Tack fee. Oh, the anyone can farm experience. Thank you. I knew I should know what that means. Okay. Yeah, we're located in Marion, Michigan. So, Southwest Indiana. So, you're, yeah, you're down by, probably down by the border. So, you're a ways. But, all right. Joni's got a busy life. Yeah. The anyone can farm experience. Tac V. Okay. Well, that like, sounds military, doesn't it? Like Mac V. <clears throat> okay. Well, we better get some better get some questions going here, you guys. Or I'm just gonna run out of things to say. It's been uh we got quite a bit of snow yesterday and it's, it's going to be real cold tomorrow, like single digits. So we're getting winters kind of coming back and I got to split out of here on next week to go to Keith's graduation down at Lackland. Um, so I'm going to be gone again and we really needed to get some things tied up before we go. Um, and we hope to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, when we get back, we're going to have a big planning meeting for tribe day. And it looks like tribe day is going to be a going concern coming up here. Uh, I'd like to have a work day here where we can actually put some people to work, getting some of this stuff done. Cause it's just a, a hoop of things that have to be done before then. Um, but our goal is to, as I said, the other night, uh, to keep the bank out of it. So a lot of the things, the building projects that we need to do just require dollars and uh, I don't want to borrow it. So that leads me to this, of you new people that are here, if you would like to, you can head over to the anyonecanfarmexperience.com and join up the Tribe Plus. 
Now, the Tribe Plus is a paywall, all right? So there's stuff on the other side of it you can't see unless you give that 49 cents a day. And what that does is it 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 helps this ministry. I know a lot of a lot of times ministry that term is used for you know religious, and I wouldn't say this is that exactly religious, um, but it is a ministry because it's a way of life and it's a uh, like a community community support how to do that and uh, pushing events that that do that, and also trying to build sort of like a parallel society that uh we're we're promoting on our own we're not waiting around for anybody to come to our rescue so we we're going to do this on our own um the tribe plus helps us to do that because the the videos cost you know everything costs and uh you know we can only make it happen so fast with your help as tribe members um that things can happen quicker right and you get access to all the stuff that's behind the paywall all the training videos uh manufacturers discounts uh, consulting with me and i'm 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 not a cheap consultant you know by any means uh if i go to your house to do consulting i get paid while i'm traveling there and i get 200 dollars an hour when I'll, while i'm on site and I have to do that because if I was to do, let's say I did $50 an hour, I would never be able to be here. I have to raise the pain point so that people say, okay, yeah, I really need him, you know. Um, and phone calls, I charge $100 an hour for a consulting call because I have to stop what I'm doing, sit down with, you know, your file and and get all the information and get the lay of the land and figure out what you want to do and try to piece together a good plan moving forward. And it is productive. I mean, it's the best hundred bucks you'll ever spend. We're trying to sweeten the deal on this uh, Tribe Plus membership thing. So we offer consulting via Zoom call on Wednesday nights. We're going every other Wednesday night because people, even though there's quite a few people in the Tribe Plus, uh, only a few people are taking advantage of it. And so we're going about every other week. But I could see a time when we go every single week on Wednesday nights. So if you if you join up for Tribe Plus, you have access to that. And then you have, you know, you have direct access to me. You can ask specific questions and we can spend you know, a fair amount of time on those questions. Plus you get to listen in on other people who are asking, you know, pertinent questions. Make no mistake, in this homesteading game, uh, there are people that are moving ahead rapidly, rapidly. And I think that it is a good position to be in. Regardless of what happens, you know, if the wheels fall off society, obviously it's going to be a good place to be, right? But if they don't, I'm staying. I don't care. I'm not going to, oh, I'm going to go work for uh, some corporation so I can live in Chicago and make the big bucks. N no, <laughs> no. I just came back from Chicago. It was, uh, I'm having PTSD. <laughs> I, I'm not. I, I don't even know what that really looks like. But uh, it was an eye opener for sure. We lived down there for like three days and it was just a real eye opener and, uh, not interested, not interested in doing that. Okay. We're at nine fifteen. Anything ballistic saying free bird. Yeah. <clears throat> what do we got here? Okay. Mumsy. Should I buy chicks from Tractor Supply? I'm ready to house some chickens first time. Should I buy from a box store or search for a hands-on chicken farmer? You know, I when you buy them from Tractor Supply, they're coming from a hatchery. Tractor Supply doesn't have their own hatchery. They don't really even have their own feed. You know, they I think it's Purina makes the feed. And they put a tractor supply logo on the back. But if you read down there, you'll see, oh, it's made by Purina. Or one of those Land O'Lakes or 
Tractor Supply is just like a big hardware store chain. That's all, right? So I don't think, I mean, lately here, they've been getting a lot of bad PR for having tranny shows and killer chicken feed. I don't know. I don't know. I can't get, you know, if I buy a hammer from there and it's, I pick it up on the shelf and I'm going to buy it, I'm going to buy it. Right. I don't care about the, you know, I don't think tranny shows are a good thing for kids, but I, the, I think the parents need to have their heads examined if they take their, their kids to that stuff. It's not, I can't see why tractor supply would do that, but I don't know. I don't want to give it too much attention because it just, it's better to just ignore it. You know, there's all kinds of weird things. Um, but I think it's better to just pay attention to what we're doing and hang around with our own and promote this instead of, oh, can you believe that? A tranny show, a tractor supply. I don't want to, I just, if they did it here, I just would probably never go back in. You know, I just, I'd cancel them. Right. So I think you can get them from, from there, but uh, you know, tractor supply, when they buy them like here in Michigan, they buy them from Townline hatchery which is in Zeeland, Michigan, which isn't terribly far from here. <clears throat> so I can call down there and I can say, hey, I want some chicks. And then they come in the mail and I'm paying, I'm not paying the markup that Tractor Supply would put on it. So I wouldn't be buying it from, I have in the past, because here's what happens. It, it's kind of a strange thing and it's counterproductive. Um, it's counterintuitive, I mean. Okay, so Tractor Supply gets in all these chicks. And some of them sell out and they're gone. And then some of them are there for three weeks. And the manager of the store is, hey, we got to get rid of these. And so when you're in there, if you can, if you can swing it, you say, well, what about these chickens here? These things are getting kind of old. You're going to have to, yeah, we'll give them to you half price. Uh, could you do a little better than that? <laughs> actually look at all the feed they already have in them so you're getting a three-week-old chick instead of a day-old chick what the day-old chicks they're worth more no it's the other way around the three three-week-old chick is worth way more right because the the dead the death factor is over when they're three weeks you don't have to put a heat lamp on them anymore at three weeks and they just they're eating feed and drinking water and they're on their way to whatever they're going to be. If they're going to be a, a broiler, they only have another five weeks to go and then you're butchering them. Or if they're going to be an egg layer, they have what? 13 weeks to go. They say 16 weeks. I don't know. It seems like it's always a little bit longer than that. $4.99 by four. $4.99 each. I don't think I'd go for that. I don't know if I'd go for that, but, um, yeah, this year there's a lot of competition for chicks because everybody's, you know, they're listening to the hype, you know, they're listening to all the stories and stuff. And I know those things are happening, but like the system in the United States is so huge, right? And there are well-paid people that are looking for a weak spot to be able to fill in that weak spot because then there's a huge boon for them. So, uh, you know, something goes wrong in some state and a chicken house burns down, somebody's going to take up the slack and they're going to profit taking up the slack. So they'll burn a chicken house down or a chicken house burns down and they say, oh boy, <laughs> eggs, <laughs> they're going to be they're going to be few and far between. Come on. That's baloney. But, you know, if you have your own chickens, then you kind of like run along. Don't you have some dusting to do? Go on. Get out of here. With their shenanigans, all the little games that they're playing. That's why you want to be 
far more self-sufficient. So when they, they play their little games, I had a conversation with a guy today and he's kind of wrapped around the axle about, oh, gee, what do you think the country's going to look like in five years? And I used to have those conversations and I would, ah, gee, I don't know. Uh, seems like, yeah. I saw a guy down in Chicago with earmuffs on that were like poofy uh, pink with little ears on them. He had his hair cut in a mohawk. He was wearing some getup like he was in Queen or something. It was just ridiculous, but he was dirty. And he had silver teeth, right? And he's walking along singing to himself. And he was it, man. He was it. Like, if you think that I'm not cool, then there's something wrong with you. That was his attitude. He was it. Now, where do I think he's going to be in a few years? I don't, I don't think it looks good. But I'm not going where he's going. I'm telling you that right now. I'm developing this piece of property, this farm, to serve this community. And I'm having eggs for breakfast. And that's where I'm going. So there's competing factions in this country right now. And they're way above our level. They're way above our level. And I think people believe that, uh, well, they're, they're spying on you. Your smart TV is actually watching you. What do they care? You don't affect anything that they, that they cherish. Money and power, you don't affect that. And I don't want to. See, the thing is, I don't want to. I don't want to affect their money and power. It's not, it's not of any interest to me. I want eggs for breakfast, a warm bed to sleep in, clean water, you know, recreation, my friends, place where they can come over when you have campfires, you know, my grandkids, that type of stuff. You know, I'm not really interested in the thing. So, so like, we can't affect their thing. They don't care about us. Now, this whole trying to move people into the cities, that is a control measure, right? And that usually seems to me being done on local levels. Like you have people coming out of universities that probably should go get a job someplace, but they go to work for these departments and they just assume that it's their job to, con to control. And once they get control, they get power, it becomes insatiable and they can't stop. But you don't have to play their game. And I've told you that many, many times. You do not have to play their game. They would just assume you all live in population centers and then that these just be massive, massive corporate farms. But that whole plan is falling apart now too. So I, the country is, is going through ebbs and flows. And now they're, I heard today, I mean, I actually heard this. Uh, it seemed like a very good source that um, they're sending people home from the embassy in, in Russia. Yeah, could be a lot of things, but I mean, some of these people that are in charge right now in Washington, they don't seem like they're running on eight cylinders. They don't seem like they're, they're like a couple, couple eggs shy of a dozen, if you know what I mean. And they have a lot of skeletons in their closet. So if they can start a war, it will take all the focus off of them. And if you think this is new, think again. It isn't. You've always had that type of parasitic uh, dirt bag that has gravitated towards leadership in government. Right? They, they're gra they gravitate towards it. And when they get there, they... They lose control of themselves, it seems like. And, you know, I recently there was a, a thing that came out. It was a list of um, people who were up on murder charges, bankruptcies, drug abuse, DUIs, bounce checks. And the list was on and on and on. And the guy that was reading it says, well, do you think this was the NFL or the NBA? And this little girl says, well, it's, pr it's probably the NBA, you know. 
and you're they're taking you down the road of ooh, don't be racist, don't be racist. No, actually, that's the Congress of the United States. Yeah. So they're the ones that are making the choices. And if you think they're making choices for you, <laughs> I got a piece of property to sell you. <laughs> and the thing is, though, you, you always were responsible for yourself. You always were. And now is the time to grasp that, um, embrace that, and then start to make us make priorities and spend your money wisely. Um, you're going to, in the homesteading game or any other game, you're going to be faced with choices. And you either make a good choice or a bad choice, right? It's up to you, right? And if you rack up a bunch of good ones and then you have a bad one, it'll take you back a little ways. But if you have bad choice, bad choice, bad choice, bad choice, and then one good one, whoa, look at me. No, 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 no. You're way out of balance here. You can start making good choices. And if you can't, you need to start asking someone, well, what should I do? There's people in my life that make bad choices. And I say to them, I don't know if I would do that. I, I, I don't know if I'd do that. They do it anyway. And so you just like, all right, well, it's a learning process. You're, you will figure it out or not. But, um, I was like that too. I was uh, very headstrong. Boy, I was not a good airman. I was not a good airman. Russia backed out of the start two treaty. We don't have the strongest foreign policy at the moment. Yeah. Start two treaty was the, uh, it was the de-escalation of nuclear weapons treaty. I remember that because I actually got to play. I got to play a Russian. Uh, they, they got to come to our base with a contingent and walk through. And I got to play one of them. And uh, what they wanted, it was, a, it was practice. And what they wanted me to do was uh, leave the area that I was supposed to be contained in you know, intentionally push the limits and walk into and, and let the, uh, let the crowd walk past me. And then I would, and yeah, that was real interesting. Start to remember that. I don't know. We don't know though. Hug. We don't really know. We don't know the functionality of their nuclear weapons. We don't know. We don't know their ICBM capabilities. We don't. And every year, every year, we launch an ICBM from Vandenberg and we let everybody know, hey, we're going to do this. Y'all watching? Here it goes. Because the, the, the nuclear explosive device is doable. You know, you could probably buy nuclear weapons uh, many places, but the intercontinental ballistic missile technology which you guys might be thinking well that's pretty easy uh the germans did that with the v2 rocket no they didn't that was not intercontinental intercontinental means that missile goes out and i don't we don't know i mean it, i'm not privy to the to to that i don't know but it goes out and then it travels very quickly and then re-enters the atmosphere, which is really tricky, and then comes down within a city block, I'm told, of, of a target with multiple warheads. And it's supposed to be moving so fast that it's very difficult to do anything about. Now, we know that we can do this. Like, I know that we can do this because we do it. We demonstrate it every year. And so what do the Russians do? They have a parade and they have their nuclear weapons that they haul down the street with trucks. Are they real? Do they have anything in them? Or do they not have the number of people, the scientists, the, the ability to build them and maintain them? We don't know. I kind of think they don't, honestly. I tell you what, I do know. Here's what I do know. And you guys can know this too. If you just want to do a little, little research on aircraft carriers and the Russians, 
uh, you can research the Russian aircraft carrier because they have one and it's broke. It's been broke for 10 years, but you can research that. There's some good videos on it. it shows you, you know, aircraft carriers are something that we've been doing since World War II. Like right now, a jet just launched and right now one just recovered because we have 15 of them or 15, 17, 19. It, it moves around because they come in and out of service. <clears throat> and uh, we've been doing that since World War II really well, since before World War II, actually. And we have young men, the, our best and brightest, that risk their life to do that Why? Uh, I'm not sure why young men do what they do, honestly, even though I was one and I did things that I look back on. Why did I do that? I just thought it was the thing to do. I can't actually tell you, well, it's because I love my country. And well, that really wasn't it. It's my father was in the Air Corps and then I came in the Air Force and volunteered for everything and wound up as an LC guy. And, um, so that yeah, I, that's what I did. And um, but these guys uh, flying these F-18s and F-35s off of carrier decks, it's extremely difficult, and you have to be very skillful. They, I got an F-18 buddy right now that's a member of the the farm. Comes and gets milk every week. I talk to him all the time. You know they they use them up. They just use them right up. You know, and. Uh, the Chinese are, you know, our biggest adversary. If you hear the commentators, uh, they have two aircraft carriers, two. And one of them is the same as the Russians because it was being built in Ukraine. They built two of them and the Russians didn't take shipment or they didn't take delivery of the second one, obviously. And the Ukrainians needed some cash. So they sold it to the Chinese. And the Chinese never did have aircraft carrier operations. They never did. So they didn't start out flying low-performance aircraft off of a carrier. They never did that. So if you never did that, you think you're going to get in a high-performance turbine, a jet, and take off if you never did it before? And then even better than that, you're going to land it? <laughs> I mean... So for a long time, and you can't really even find out. It's hard to find. It's information that's hard to find out. And I think that's a tragedy. I've, I've got a good friend, uh, an officer friend that worked in, I won't say, but I cornered him and I said, are they recovering their aircraft on board ship? Yes or no? He didn't want to tell me. You know, if they're not able to do that, then their aircraft carriers are kind of useless. I mean, it's a good training platform, but they can't park them 200 miles off the coast of California and strike at the heartland because they can take off, but where are they going to land? They can't make it back to China. So it's just, uh, you know, I don't. I think it's like a lot of things. I think that we get told things and there has to be a boogeyman out there for us to fight. And I don't, I don't necessarily believe there is one. And I don't think it's the Russians for sure. Okay. Dave and Sonia is with us. Okay. Russia has been refurbishing their bomb shelters and requesting people to prepare for nuclear war. So that's not a great sign. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I remember in this country, in our country, we used to, I never did, but before me, the kids before me were hiding under their desks, right? Because there possibly was going to be a nuclear exchange. So they, yeah, you got to get under your desk. And throughout America, there's, there's homes that have underground bomb shelters. Um, and I think it's sort of a, 
uh, I think it's a, you know, it's it's sort of like the Trump card, you know. When you say that you're really going to put the hurt on somebody, you're going to nuke them. You're going to nuke them. Okay, well, how much, how much do we really know about nuclear weapons? You know, like there's a lot of nebulous things about it. And don't get me wrong. I have actually been in a revetment uh, pretty regularly. I used to have to do this. And there was what they called short-range attack missiles or SRAMs. And our our bombers carried uh, two racks of them, two, uh, they call them clips. And uh, they were about this big around and probably about 20 feet long. And they were, they were nukes. And they were on these, these trailers. And my job was to go in there and make sure the tire pressure was okay on the trailers. But you'd have to go in there with three guys and one of them had a shotgun. And it was crazy. And it was crazy security police that were just looking for you to make a mistake. Um, so I've had my hands on them. You know, I've touched them. But I don't, you know, I don't know how they work. You know, I have no idea. I don't even know if they were real. I don't know. I, you know, public psyops says, says Hugabug. I'd like to know your take on that. If you believe that we have all the nuclear weapons that we say we do, you might know a little bit more about that than I would. Uh, look into Royston Potter, retired <laughs> Army National Guard, Lieutenant Colonel. I've listened to, I've listened to him before. I have. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Welsh says the bomb shelter placard used to be next to the entrance of my school in the early sixties. Yep. My school was the same way. I remember that now. I can't exactly make it out, but I remember seeing it. <clears throat> Galen Windsor proved you can actually eat uranium. No dose are more dangerous. Huh. B-61s. B-61 is that Moab, isn't it? I think. Moab, the mother of all bombs. But it's uh, M, Moab, I forget. B-61s. B-61s, is that the SRAM? Oh, well. <laughs> Could be a psyop just relaying what I've heard. You know, honestly, uh, when we you replay the tape of what you've been told, and then something comes up. I mean, if you guys haven't looked into the moon landing thing, I would encourage you to look into it because it's always been a little flimsy to me. And then when you you go through the whole process. And uh, it just seems very flimsy, very flimsy that that happened. And oh, how, how could that happen? Uh, even when I was a kid, I was nine years old when that happened. And I thought, this doesn't look right. You know, it looked a little fake. And uh, I think it I think it actually was staged, you know, for whatever reason. And you think, why would they do a thing like that? And then people will say, oh, they had to fool the Russians. No, nah, I don't think so. I think they were trying to fool us. And I think it's like they NASA goes through an awful lot of dollars and on what? And well, we would know, I'm sure. No, we wouldn't know. E even if you're in the military for 20 years, you're so compartmentalized. You just know what you're supposed to do. You don't see the big picture. But sometimes you can observe and say, well, wait a minute here. You know, you can. But. Oh, B-61 is probably the nukes I saw. Maybe. Maybe. Small nuke. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, I know people who, and I've heard this chatter, Jeremy, I've heard this chatter riding out to a launch site with launch control officers that have said, I don't know if it'll work. That's not my job. I have no idea what's in the tip of that thing. You know, they're in this hole and the nukes are all around them. They never inspect them. They don't know. They're just there to, you know, this guy turns this key and this guy turns this key. And then I guess, I don't know how they do it exactly, but they're the launch control guys. And they've even said, how would we know if, if it's going to work? You know, the, the launches that we do from Vandenberg every year, it's, it's demonstrating the ICBM capabilities. They don't touch off a nuke when it comes down. That's not the part of it that they do. They just want to demonstrate that they could put it in your yard. Hey, I got a, I, I had a incident and this is, this is true. A kid came to work for me and, uh, he was a little different. I noticed I'm behind the desk, right? I'm the Sergeant. He's a brand new guy and his name is Malkoff. <laughs> and they said, Malkoff, where are you from Malkoff? And he says, Russia. No, no. He says, he says, Moscow. I said, Moscow. Where's that in Indiana? And he says, no, Russia. I'm sitting there looking at him. He's not scared of me either. And he's a brand new kid out of tech school. And I'm thinking, this seems a little strange. And I said, you're telling me that you're from Russia. And he says, yeah. I said, what are you doing in the Air Force? He says, I defect. You defected from Russia and now you're here and we're working on nuclear missile sites? Yeah. I said, okay. All right. All right. Good. Uh, well, go and get, get, get your room and, uh, you know, get down a supply, get your stuff. And, uh, you know, I'll see you tomorrow. Come on in, get a haircut. Yeah. And come on in tomorrow, bright and early. I want to see you here bright and early. I made a beeline down to the first sergeant's office and said, you're not going to believe what I just heard. And he says, you're going to tell me about Malkoff, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I said, how can this be? And he says, he, he's got a security clearance. He defected from that country. It gets better. Turns out he was a pretty good guy, right? V very good guy. He was a good airman. When he would come in from the field, we would sit and talk. And he was more than willing to talk to me, you know, about life in Russia because he missed it, right? His family was there. But I got to gain an insight into what communism is like. And it, it always seemed to me that communism was this great, huge thing that I didn't understand that just oppressed people so terribly, you know. And it did, but here's how it works. Like he would tell me how it works. So him and his mother lived in the, in the city and with his little sister. And if they wanted to go on vacation and they were going to a different place and they had to go to a different district or sector and they had to go through a checkpoint, they had to get a travel permit to go through that checkpoint. And some places it was easy to go, but nobody wanted to go there. Some places it was hard to go because the people that live there paid the checkpoint people to keep them scumbags from Moscow out of here. And so you, you'd have to apply for a, a travel permit and you might get it, but it would be for a different week than you asked for. And you'd have to go down there and stand in line and say, this is the wrong week. And they'd say, that's all we can do. <laughs> you know, so they, they could punish you if they wanted to. Uh, and he would say to me, uh, I get off work now. I have money in my pocket. I have a car. I can go put gasoline in that and I can go north, south, east or west. And I don't have to ask anybody. A restaurant, I can go in there. I can buy anything I want. I can buy a pound of coffee if I want. I can buy beer if I want, you know. So he was like a 
a kid in a candy store living in the United States. And it really made me think about really how we are with our freedom, you know? And so anyway, but uh, true story, me and Malkoff were out on the site <clears throat> and we had to go down into the, the launch control area and he hadn't been down in there because sometimes the launch crews don't want anybody. They'll just say, no, not today. But they said, oh yeah, Malkoff, yeah, bring him down. So he's he goes down there and this one captain, he's a real smart guy, real smart guy, well, wise guy, I should say. He says, yeah, and there's all these buttons for the different ones. And he says, yeah, see this one, this B6 here, it's pointed at your mother's house. <laughs> Malkoff looked at him like, I can't believe you said that. The guy was from Boston, I think. Okay. They always start these wars the same way, just going to sound a little defensive aid, then a little more, and then some offensive weaponry, and, of course, then troops. Yeah, I hate to see that happen. Yeah, I hate to see that happen. but And I hope it doesn't. I'm hoping that it doesn't. I'm hoping somebody gets a handle on things. Had an airman from Cuba explained a lot about communism. Yeah. We could all use a little bit of training like that. But, you know, then we started seeing that here. Um, but because of our Constitution, our uh, departments, they have to get our consent to give up our constitutional rights so that they can get us in a licensing agreement. Right. And so that's why I always say never get into a licensing agreement with any department. And I know you are with your driver's license. One of these days, I'm going to push that one, but not right now. And it would be with the state police. And I don't want to do that because they've always been good to me here. So I'm probably just not going to hit that press to test. That's one I'll, I'll, I'll give in on. But as far as Department of Agriculture, any of that, never get a license from them for anything. Because once you do, you're entering into a contractual agreement with them. And usually what you're agreeing to say goodbye to is your Fourth Amendment rights and your Fifth Amendment rights, usually. You know, that means they can come on when they take a notion to and look through your stuff. Just, you know, safety. And then uh, Fifth Amendment, they can say, we don't want you doing this. We're... You know, if you're, let's say that you're making uh, prosciutto, uh, there's no law saying I can't make prosciutto. But if I enter into an agreement with them, I'm agreeing to play by their rules. And their rules might violate my constitutional rights. So be, don't, just don't enter into any contractual agreements with those guys. All right, Jeremy, I would like that. I'd like that. I think, I think I would, I might not. Yeah. See, out of one side of my mouth, I say, just really get into growing tomato plants. And then at the other side, now we're talking about war and the PSYOP involved and all that stuff. All right. I could see all, I could see us all acting like that. If we were sectioned off, we kind of proved that recently. Uh, I, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm, 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 I think maybe you might have, or you know people that did, but there was many of us that said, no, not doing it, and hit the press to test. Okay, what are you going to do? If I don't do what you want me to do, what are you going to do? And they, there was nothing they could do. So they put a big fear thing out there, a lot of peer pressure, and um, people – succumb to that but a lot of people said i'm not doing it i don't care and you know even in the truther community you will see stories i saw one the other day and as soon as i read it it was like nah that's bs but it said the fbi is tracking people who did not take the you know what and i said well, i gotta see this sure it was it was baloney they don't care they don't care. They got enough of you that did take it. Plus, they're going to need some of us around to take the trash out. So, 
All right, Jeremy, I'm up for that. I'm up for that. You're the one that's working a straight job now, so why don't you call me? Not tonight, though. Craig is saying nuclear weapons are a psyop. I'd like to know where you heard that because I've heard it too. I've heard it too. And you know, even though I was in that business, I have no firsthand knowledge of the reality of nuclear weapons. I don't. I just, it. I don't have it. I would have to have faith that what I was handling was in, in reality a nuclear weapon. I have to have faith. Now, they were treated like they were nuclear weapons. I had to play the game. But, hey, will that explode? I don't know. I have no idea. That, that wasn't my job to know. So I don't know. Penny Lund. Uh, okay, I'm going to... Um, I'm not going to, I don't want to hurt your feelings here, but I want to parse this out a little bit. Um, people I worked with lost their jobs from not doing the, the thing, right? Um, I, I happen to have counseled with quite a few people during this time. And now I was never put under the gun to do that, except, uh, I got some nieces that said, you can't come visit the kids if you won't take it and get a flu shot too. And I said, well, then I won't be seeing you. You know, that was, I'm not, no. As soon as somebody puts pressure on me to do something, I'm not doing it. I had enough of that for 20 years in the Air Force. Remember, you go to commander's call and then you can only get out through one door. Yeah. And you got to get a flu shot before you leave. 20 years I put up with that. I'm not doing it. <clears throat> But usually what I encountered was people get an ultimatum saying that if you don't do this, don't come to work. And they that computes in their mind that, oh, I'm being fired if I don't do this. Where what they should have done is said, well, I'm here to inform you that I'm not doing it. And I want a firing notice. And I want it in writing because I am going to sue you. So go for it. Fire me. Right. But most of the people that I, I mean, every one of them that I talked to, they said, well, they said I couldn't come to work if I didn't get it. And then there was a nurse actually that I know that when she went to work, they had cut her or they had shut her out. So she, her password wouldn't work. She couldn't clock in, but she said, well, I'm here and I'm staying here and you guys can't do anything. Um, you guys can't do anything. You can't touch me. So either give me a letter saying that you're firing me, which will be the beginning of my lawsuit against this company. See, it's like this. Contracts are everything in the United States because we have our constitution. <clears throat> when you go to work, let's say you go to work for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, the day that you go to work for them, you do this and you swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and obey the, the lawful orders of the officers appointed above you, right? That's your term of employment, right? So midterm... You know, and it's four year to four year to four years. Sometimes, sometimes you can go for six, but usually it's it's four years and then another one four years. Now, let's say at the end of the first four years, they say, "Okay, we're going to offer you another contract for another four years of service to the country." But in this contract, it says, "And you have to have your pinky cut off." You at that point can say, okay, I don't need it anyway. It's worth it to me to get my pinky cut off and I'll take another four years. 
and so be it. So you got another four years. They want this from you. You want this from them. You agree. You re-up. At the end of that four years, now you're in eight years. They say, uh, we'll give you another four years. And all you got to do is, sh you know, you don't have to cut off another pinky. Uh, nothing. You just, same contract. If it's okay with you, we'll, we'll swear you in again. And now you're at 9, 10, 11, 12 years, right? So that's that's kind of how it goes. Uh, but even my son went through this. Uh, he was in the middle of a, a contract period. And they said, oh, you're going to need to do this. And he counseled with me. I actually talked with Jeremy about it. I, and finally what we came up with was, okay, put it in writing that you're going to deny me enlistment. You're going to deny me or you're going to kick me out if I won't do this. They didn't. They didn't. And there was stories floating around about people being kicked out because they wouldn't. But when you read into the stories, it was actually, well, yeah, he had, he's on his second DUI and he wouldn't take the vaccine. But as far as I know, I don't know of anybody that was let go mid-contract because they wouldn't comply with something that was extra contractual. So let, let's turn it around. It'll make sense if we turn this around. Uh, in this case, we had employers telling employees. Oh, it's 10 o'clock. Yeah. Employers telling employees that you got to do this. And uh, but let's turn it around. All right. Let's say you have a contract of employment with Walmart and. Uh, you will, it says you'll show up this time. The pay will be this much, da, 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 da. And uh, you're fulfilling that. And then one day you show up to work and you say, uh, you know what? I want $10 an hour more raise. They'll look at you and they'll say, that's not the contract that we're working off of. If you, if you wish to renegotiate the contract, then you have to put it in writing that you would like to renegotiate the contract. But this is not a good time to do that. You know, you're only been here 10, you know, two weeks, right? So it was the same thing with people who were working under contract in hospitals and every place else. No place in the original contract did it say, if we want you to take an experimental vaccine, you got to do it. No place. And now we're seeing if people had say, nope. If you want me out of here, you got to fire me and I want it in writing. Now we're seeing people who did that uh, taking legal action against the companies and they're getting back pay and reinstated. And now all the people that succumb to the pressure are like, wish, boy, I wish I hadn't have done that. Wish I hadn't have done that. Anyway, it's almost 10. So I better get going. <clears throat> <laughs> I had a boss fire me before I showed up and put my coveralls on. I was there for another eight years after that. Uh, let's see. What is it? I missed one. Having too much fun tonight. Right. Interesting. It was put right in the policy manual. Yeah, but was it put in after, you know, you had contract, you're working under contract? You know, that's like, see what I'm saying? It's like you adding something, you adding something to the contract after, you know, you've both agreed. Okay. You're going to work here. Yeah. You're going to be here this time. Yeah. I'm, okay. We're going to pay you this much. Okay. I'll do this. These are my duties. And then a week later they change the contract. No, that's, that's grounds for legal action. That's a civil, that's a civil problem. And you can sue those people. And I would even go better than that. If we want to start, start talking about lawsuits, uh, you never want to go after, you never want to go after the company because they have lawyers and they'll drag their feet and they know how to do it. You want to go after that boss who told you that you got to do this. You inform them, well, I'm suing you. 
he'll say, well, I'm just doing my job. I don't care. I'm suing you. What you're doing is illegal. I'm suing you. And he might think, I don't know if I want to do this. I mean, I'm not getting $2 an extra, $2 an hour uh, pay raise to, you know, make these people do this. I didn't even want to do it myself, probably. Anyway, we can talk about that another, another time. Hired at a place, it was policy with no jab. Yeah. Something you just sent. Yeah, you have to call it bluff for sure. Enlisting and signing is different than a mother taking her kids or ailing parent to a doctor's appointment. We are trusting individuals as a whole to a fault. That's correct. That's correct. There's a component to that, though, that I think you need to know that is happening right now. It is happening right now. Okay. Um, it was a trickle-down effect that, oh, you can't sue these companies. You can't sue them. They've got immunity. They were granted immunity from who? From Congress. <laughs> really? Oh, I, I like that. Okay, well, then don't sue them. Don't sue them. Sue the doctor. Yeah. Then the doctor has got to either, either call in their malpractice insurance buds, which I'm sure they're going to be right there for this. But if you don't do anything, you know, I know that you were probably put in a rough situation. You can't come in here to see this person if you won't do this. I know that that's a tough situation. And I, like I went in several establishments that that was their policy and everything else. And I just walked right by him. You know, um, I never had the, the opportunity to go into a hospital, but I would not have done any of their stuff. I would not have done it, but uh, the component that I'm talking about, it's called payback. And the rage that's growing in this country, I think it's going to stem from the people who took that, that medicine that right now are a little on the worried side. I would be. I'm worried for them. Right? I'm worried for them. Yeah, so uh, it could slide the other way. And unfortunately, when it slides the other way, when the masses get involved, it ain't pretty. But uh, we, we've got an MD right down here in town. Uh, and her job is to know what this, what this is so she can give what's called informed consent to the to the people she's saying you should take this and they're saying what's in it she says well i don't know i don't know well how can there be informed consent like she's saying yeah i i would all the things that are in here have been proven over a long long studies uh the chances are really good that it's going to work for you and it's not going to hurt you there was none of that so there was no one informed consent that will not stand up in a court of law so, you know what they say about payback? I, we all know what they say about payback. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Mumsy. I, I, all right, David Duncan saying hi and bye. Another good one. Thanks, Deb. I got to get going because it's past 10. Um, my daughter-in-law was fired from her CNN job for non-compliance. And there again, David, I would like, you know, then she, if she has a notice of being fired, then right now is when she needs to be uh, going back at them. You know, I get my job back and I get back pay or I'm suing you. That's not hard to do. You don't even need a lawyer to do that. The wicked are always surprised that the good can be clever. We need to get creative. That's right in line with what my good friend Owen says all the time, and it's evil is weak. Continue to build, right? They're killing their own.
Worried for many who have made bad choices. Yeah, me too, man. All right. I got to get going. Thanks, you guys, for staying with us tonight. It's a two-hour show. Didn't mean it to be, but uh, appreciate it. Uh, nothing going on until the week after next, unless we choose to go on like next Tuesday on the road. Don't know if that's going to happen. All right. I'm going to be on the road, so I don't know. So next week might just be uh, open all week. We're going to have to see. We're going to have to play it by by ear because I can't make any promises. But there will not be an interview next week. That's for sure. And no consulting call. Okay. I'm going to end the stream. Good night, everybody. Remember, anyone can farm. See ya.